Now it's time for J.M. O'Neill, a name you might not be familiar with. But with this book, Open Cut, published in 1986 at the age of 64, and with this book, Duffy is Dead, he established himself as a writer of great power who addressed the London Irish building workers' experience. Here in this short film directed by Paul Duan, we take a brief look at his work. Writing a book is not easy. There's no use telling people, oh, you sit down and write a book. Lots of people sit down and never get past the first chapter. Lots of people finish books and they're bad. You're very lucky, like I have been, if you write four books and have them all published. So I was lucky, somebody was smiling on me. Don't give up your day job, you sort of thing. But my day job gave me up. And so I, I said, you must do something else. I started to write. I was 64. Now, you don't, there aren't an awful lot of people at 64 to start writing. So I started off by selling two books at once. And that was uh, Open Cut and Duffy is Dead. Then I went back after that and I did uh, Canon Bang Bang. And um, then I, after that I did Camus O'Connell. Came back to Ireland and uh, sat down and said, well, I'll write a book in the west of Ireland. And I'll have it published in the west of Ireland. <laughs> and printed in the West of Ireland, which it is, Bennett and Company, is a purely West of Ireland novel. And so I found I could write relatively good speed and I could turn out a reasonable product. I haven't read anyone else who has done that London Irish world in that way, in as two markedly different, but in their each in its own way brilliantly successful books as Duffy is Dead and Open Cut. My first London journey was from old Euston Station, long gone now, of course, to Camden Crossroads. It presaged a decade of street graft, wheels, dawns and dusks, the hammer and stink of diesel. Not tourist London or the canyons of the financial square mile, but east and northeast London, the river banks, the sprawl of Deptford and Woolwich, with peeling colour, grime and running sores. There were hard times and it was a hard business. No time for the weaklings there. And uh, so I said, I'll write about it. So Open Cut was the result and um, I hope it does, it at least does them some credit, you know, because they, they, it's about, you find that the people in Open Cut, even though they're hard work, they're good people. When I read Open Cut, I couldn't compare it to anything because nobody else seemed to have done that. And it was a revelation that somebody had spotted that in the London Irish world of people living on the lump, of everything in cash, of people with shadowy pasts, and behind it all a kind of clientelist mafia boss relationship, and also a slightly sinister kind of politics. You know, all this we know from the best American thrillers. Nobody had done it set in Britain or in Ireland, and nobody had seen that the London Irish building site world lent itself so perfectly to this. Jerry writes brilliantly about um, that industry, which is, I suppose, after grass, endemic to. If grass is the, is the metaphor for rural Ireland, property is the metaphor for urban Ireland. Jerry is brilliant on property and building. I love the building trade. It just came to me naturally. I, 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 I went out with a civil engineer on a job and after fought with him I could use a dumpy level and a theodolite. It was a dreadfully hard life. I mean, you were, you were out of bed at half past five in the morning and uh, you were into Camden Town by half past six. I was supervising so I had transport but most of them was into the back of a truck and sitting on seats and trundled off hither and to, the, to any one of maybe 17 or 18 sites we had in London. They worked in bad weather, good weather, in muck and dirt. And when they finished, they were tired. They were tired. And when they came back, all they had to do, I mean, a pub was heaven with heat and a drink. The pub is such an important part of the life of the Irish in Britain, especially the building community, and he ran the pub, the Duke of Wellington and the Balls Pond Road, so he knows, the, he knows what he's talking about. He knows the harshness, the cruelty, and the wonderful wild madness of it all. 
He's in the great dirty realist tradition of the 1940s and his books are cited among the Irish labourers who came to London and contractors and the contractors who exploit the Irish labourers let us set up no simple little anti-British bit here. Jerry writes about Irish contractors who uh, exploit Irish labourers using the county system very often, you know, we're all from Kerry lads, so you won't be looking for a decent wage this week kind of thing. And I remember another man who in his time had been a king among the diggers, he could dig more than anybody else and so on. And he, he was watchman and a job I was doing down at Charing Cross Station. And this watchman there, I knew him when he was at his best. And he had, he was, he had the old big disease. And he was sitting at the watchman's brazier. And he died, of course, weren't you? And I, and I said, well, I'm going to his funeral, which I did, out in Leytonstone. Catholic cemetery, and I went out, and when I went out, there wasn't anybody there except myself. And of course, as I noticed, he was in Pauper's Corner. There was no, just just grass growing, and they, where they bury people in dozens, like to put down two coffins and cover them over and so on until they fill it in with us, maybe eight or ten coffins. In it. Eventually, the, 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 the hearse arrived, and this great man who could outdig everybody else he was lifted across the side by four not very well dressed, uh, whatever, Paul Bears carried to his grave. And, and a Church of England pastor came down and read the prayers, and that was the end of him. And I said, How sad. It astonishes me that the early O'Neill novels are out of print because I think they deserve to be in print a lot more than a lot of other things. Um, the difference between um, Open Cut and Duffy is Dead is enormous, and yet the worlds are not dissimilar. It's London, Ireland, or London, Irish. It's North London, very definitively, very geographically um, expressed. It's almost like, not to be pretentious, but it's almost like William Blake's London. You know, every street, every area, Hackney, Dalston, Balls Pond Road, is defined in an almost spiritual way. Well, I think Duffy is Dead, undoubtedly for me, is a low-life comic masterpiece. I think it's the best piece of writing, most grotesque, funniest, harshest piece of writing that I've come across in a long, long time. When Neil and Mackesy are uh, remembering Duffy in the middle of the night, when, when they awaken Callan and he gives them brandy, um, and one, I think Neil and toasts Duffy, and he, his toast is something like um, uh, a tribute from his bodies, liffy men all, his father's house, the bed of heaven to him. And you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's amazing kind of jargon, it means nothing, but it means a lot. You know, it's men striving for significance out of a most banal event, and there's nothing more banal than death. Each of Jerry's sentences carries a whole culture and a society and a time and a place in it. And that makes him a great writer. He will, in future times, be regarded as a great writer, uh, one of our great writers. Um, and I think he'll be classed up beside O'Fellain and O'Connor and, and, and Trevor. Uh, and I wish, but I wish he was recognised. I think people should recognise in their own lifetime, as Brendan Bean says, posterity be damned. I've never given in. I've written uh, six novels now, one unpublished and five published. And, um, and that's kept me going with my pension and things like that, and kept my mind active, and kept me from going around worrying about myself and the you know. And uh, I love small town life, and Kilkee is, you know, a lot of nice people and good people here, and in Kilrush up the way. All of Jerry's books should be in print. They're not in print. Everybody should be reading Jerry O'Neill. If you like Cormac McCarthy. If you like Elmore Leonard, if you like a rattling good plot, if you like a great read and you like high literature, you should read Gerry O'Neill. So I just can't understand why he's the invisible man of Irish letters. Gangs eat in cafes when they can, wait for the evenings and the warmth of drinks, sleep like the dead until the alarms explode them into another day. A year has a quarter of smashed cadavers, pulled up, into the daylight, hardly wept over, coffined with raised glasses and whip rounds, sent to the limbo cemeteries of Leytonstone and Finchley, or the spent ones 
alcoholics, wasting on the newsprint and cardboard carpets of a hundred dosses, routing houses, kips, spittlefield back doubles, a relentless world of hire and fire, of burning affinities, spleens, and sometimes the overspill of hatred to maim and kill. This experience has been written about in Irish, Deal and Jury, but by Donald Macaulay, for instance. But what did you think of this? Well, I, I, I first of all, thought it was very inspiring to see a man who started out in his literary career at 64, so I feel I don't have to rush myself any longer. Yeah. But, uh, and, and it's been done in music. I mean, it's been done from Paddy Works on the Railway to Shane yes, McGowan. Yes. So I think if you have Shane on the turntable and that man's books in your hand, you'll get the complete picture. That'll take you to yes. what's left of the winter. <laughs>